I was gonna say like why not CNN or but what who cares? White Truth right is it about a future movie or something coming out or No. Okay. It's not about any movie, it's not about the movies I've made in the past. It's a confession of sorts. Okay. I mean about you cheated on your wife, you no. plagiarized I would never do that. No. Plagiarized something. It's about a movie I made that nobody is aware of even though they've seen it. Okay. Is that intriguing? Do I have you intrigued? Well, I mean, see if I understand what you said. It's about a movie you made, no one knows you made. Is that what you said? That's right. It's a production. Like, I, I, some I of you put, on. like, uh, you didn't put your name on it? Like, at the end, you put, like, a fake name? Oh, no. I I made it. Like, Alan Smithy? Like, that's that right. Thing? No, I didn't. There was no name put on it. Why? Why would there be no credits? What do you mean? Because there are some things that you just can't. Put your name on. Okay. I perpetrated a huge fraud, which I am now about to detail. Okay. Involving the United States government and NASA. All right. What? And I'm sure you've heard the rumors. The moon, the moon landing. Hoax? That's right. That the moon landing was fake. The, the moon landing, moon landings, all were fake, <laughs> and I was the person who filmed it. You're serious, and okay. I'm serious. You're, I'm dead serious. Because I only have this certain amount of time with you, and I and I'll talk about whatever you want. You know, this isn't some type of joke or no, it's not film a joke. within a film thing. It's not a joke. Nope. Okay. The uh, conspiracy theorists were right on this on this occasion. Why? I don't know about Paul McCartney's death, but this they were right about. Okay, why in God's name would... I don't know what to ask you first. Why the hell, if you're telling the truth, why would you do it? Why are you telling me? I mean, what the... Don't you think it's important for people to know the truth? Yeah, I got... Uh, yes, certainly. They had a, a, a massive fraud, a, an unparalleled fraud perpetrated against them. They should know. 
Okay. Um, I, I mean, they're already suspicious of the government. They may as well have their suspicions confirmed. Okay. And well, justified. And this, why now? I mean, we're almost at the 30 year anniversary. Uh, what, what took so long? Why are you, why, why, if this is true, why? Well, I'll go into that. It has to do with personal. Okay. Uh, uh, evolution and influences. And well, I'll go into that. is that why you look a little haggard right now? Because you look a little worn. No offense. Like, well, also, yeah, because I haven't been taking care of myself too well. I've been drinking a lot, but. Is that because uh, of the stress of this? Of is course, it? stress, guilt, just conflict of all kinds. <sighs> Six million pounds of machine, 36 stories tall. Nearly 10 years work of half a million people. Through the night, it was checklisted, double checked, electronically monitored, computerized, televised, dehumanized of human error. While the night of celebration was ending, the day began for the astronauts. Breakfast, medical examination, suiting up. Neil Armstrong, Commander Apollo 11. Edwin Buzz Aldrin, Lunar Module Pilot. Michael Collins, Command Module Pilot. La tripulación subirá a la camioneta que les Wow, I mean, so you, you, you feel bad about this, clearly. I mean, this is... Not... I do feel bad about it. I also feel proud of it. It's a terrible conflict. Because you've pulled off one of the greatest hoaxes ever because of and your... And because I made a film, if you want to call it a film, which I consider to be my masterpiece. And you can't take credit or even talk about it as a... As well, a I'm hereby, well, you are now. I'm hereby taking credit. For right. It. But you can't actually go out. You're doing... When people see this, no it'll be, you'll be dead. Until 10 years. Right. Or 15, years yeah. After my death. So you can't talk to... Roger Ebert about it, you know, does that frustrate you? I have to pay the consequences for the decision that I made many years ago to go along with this. Like a deal with the devil. It's Faustian to be sure. Because, and is that why you got such power in Hollywood? I mean, that would explain that. Why I have the freedom I have, that was part of it, yes. So they, they, they said, do this moon thing and we'll when give I, you... When I made Spartacus, I didn't have this kind of freedom. Right. But I have it now. So what came and first, the NASA's, genius or the fraud? What NASA's doing? Well, what came first, the genius or the fraud? I mean, did the fraud enable the genius or was the genius released well, like the fraud? I think the genius came first. Right. But some frauds are hard to... 
bypass, especially if you have an ego and you're an artist and you, you're you presented with a challenge, the likes of which you've never seen and will probably never see again. You don't even think of the morality of it. You're just completely swept, swept away by the flattery of it and the juices inside you, which make you want to do it as the the artist you are innately. You don't think of anything else. What a conflict. I mean, gosh, I can't imagine being presented with that opportunity. On one hand, I really would want to do it, but then I'd probably say, well, I'm committing a crime and lying. And It must... depends, but my guess would be, no, you, you, if you're good, you would do it. I, I discussed this with Levinson, Barry Levinson. Right. I discussed it with... Oh, he made by the dog, right? Yeah. Yes. Spielberg, of all people, believe it or not, yes. So wait, Scors wag the dog. Coppola, yeah. Scorsese, even Woody Allen, I discussed. There isn't one of them who wouldn't do this. Right. And did that... So Barry Levinson must have been influenced by this whole... He must have known, so that's... Wag the dog is about this whole idea. Oh, I mean, that's why the character was named Stanley. Right, and he gets killed at the end because he demands he credit. Propellant load pressure and temperature. Digital transmission worldwide tracking. Stabilization and guidance. Radio frequency telemetry and voice communications. Signal conditioner integration. Spacecraft electrical power. Flight control. S4B propulsion stage monitoring. S1C, S2 propulsion stage. Every important valve, gauge, and circuit was continually monitored at Launch Control Center throughout the 28-hour countdown. Countdown is still going well, T-minus 55 minutes. This is Apollo Saturn Launch Control. We passed the six-minute mark in our countdown for Apollo 11, the flight to land of the first men on the moon. We're on time at the present time for our planned liftoff of 32 minutes past the hour. Coming up shortly, that swing arm up at the spacecraft level will come back to its fully retracted position. This should occur at the five-minute mark in the count. The swing arm now coming back as our countdown continues. Skip Chauvin informing the astronauts that the swing arm now coming back. Four minutes and counting, we are goal for Apollo 11. We'll be coming up in the automatic sequence about 10 or 15 seconds from this time. The vehicle starting to pressurize as far as the propellant tanks are concerned, and all is still go as we monitor our status for it. Firing command coming in now. We're on an automatic sequence as the master computer supervises hundreds of events occurring over these last few minutes. Two minutes, 10 seconds, and coming. Oxidizer tanks in the second and third stages now have pressurized. T minus one minute, 35 seconds. The third stage completely pressurized. T minus 60 seconds and counting. We passed T minus 60. 55 seconds and counting. Neil Armstrong reported back when he received the good wishes. Thank you very much. We know it will be a good flight. Good luck and Godspeed. 40 seconds away from the Apollo 11 liftoff. All the second stage tanks now pressurized. 35 seconds and counting. We are still go with Apollo 11. 30 seconds and counting. Astronauts report it feels good. T minus 25 seconds. 20 seconds and counting. T minus 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 12, 11, 10, 9. Ignition sequence start. Six.
tell me about the making of it. So was it difficult? I mean, committing the greatest fraud, I don't know what you want to call it. I'm not saying I it's a... Okay, I a lot about that at the time. I know, so I'm not making a moral judgment, but making this huge, ambitious, technical foe landing, was it part of the 2001? Was it very difficult? I mean, what was the experience like? Artistically, practically, emotionally, what was Nothing it like for you? Nothing was harder than 2001. So the, 2001 was harder than faking the moon landing? It actually was. Because you learned things on 2001 and... Yes. I mean, 2001 was very ambitious. And that's not to say that faking the moon landing was not ambitious. But, uh, yeah, I learned things making 2001, which is why I got this gig in the first place. Right? Right. Right. That makes sense. So um, so what was the... But it was, it was easy for me because... Um, well, first of all, I didn't think a whole lot about... The morality of it, as I said. If I had, I might have been uh, more uh, hesitant, more stifled in my work, but I didn't. And I, I could see that, that Neil was, actually. He was bothered by it. More than Buzz Aldrin or anyone else involved? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. About because in why? a way, everything was going to center around him. He was the one who was supposed to come down off the ladder and announce the, the step for mankind and what have you. Uh, he sensed that, that this was going to be a life-changing experience for him. And I mean on a major scale. Apollo went into orbit around the moon. The journey that had taken the lifetime of mankind was nearing its crucial moment. Oh, Apollo 11, Houston, we are wondering if uh, you started into the limb yet, over. The lunar module Eagle was again given a thorough checkout to ensure the functioning of all systems, as Armstrong and Aldrin prepared to seal themselves off from Collins in the command module and for the two craft to pull apart. Controllers going around the horn, gonna go for undocking. Okay, retro, go. Fido, go. Guide, go. Control, go. Telcom, go. Jinsey, go. Ecom, go. Surgeon, go. Capcom, we're go for undocking. Hello, Eagle Houston, we're standing by, over. The Eagle has wings. On its own now, but with Columbia near at hand, it coasted around to the backside of the moon, and there, while out of direct communication with the Earth, it fired its engine to slow its descent to a touchdown on the near side of the moon. Collins in Columbia continued in orbit, awaiting their return. Okay, all flight controllers, gonna go for landing. Retro. Go. Righto. Go. Guidance. Go. Control. Go. Telcom. Go. GNC. Go. Ecom. Go. Surgeon. Go. Capcom, we're go for landing. Altitude 4200. Houston, you're go for landing. Over. 
It is said that 500 million people gathered at TV sets around the world to wait for the first Earthling to set foot on the moon. Countless millions more listened on the radio to the voices from the moon. Never before had so many people been attuned to one event at one time. The world waited, curious, wondering, aware, like a sleeper wakened in the night by a faraway sound, a moment sensed, more than understood. seen the deterioration of him and I mean was he depressed or he was depressed he was uh, drinking heavily um, bitter scared uh, just phobic uh, avoiding people on July 20th 1969 Neil Armstrong stepped out of an odd-looking spaceship and into the pages of history as the first man on the moon Today, he remains one of the most famous people on the planet. But he's also famously private. For years, Armstrong has shunned the media and the limelight, but now he's about to take a giant leap back into the public view. He's finally authorized a biography entitled First Man, written by James Hansen. And for the first time, 
he's agreed to a television profile. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. Oh, boy. Walter Cronkite captured the moment. Building shaking. What a moment. Man on the way to the moon. What did it feel like? felt like a train on a bad railroad track and shaking in every direction. <laughs> and it was loud, really loud. Neil Armstrong is 75 now, an aging hero, but his winning smile is still there. We remember him as the cool and confident commander of Apollo 11, joined by his crewmates Buzz Aldrin and Michael Collins. On a windswept day, we went with Armstrong to an old Apollo launch pad at Kennedy Space Center to hear the story of one of man's greatest adventures. That July morning in 1969 when you came out and you gave that thumbs up, that was a very confident view you put on. Yeah, it was a little bit of a sham, I admit. Uh, you know, the reality is a lot of times you get up there and get in the cockpit and something goes wrong somewhere and you go back down. So actually, when you actually lift off, it's really a big surprise. <laughs> Do you recall how you came up with that? A small step for a man. What was the inspiration for it? Well, I thought, well, when I step off, I'm just going to be a little step. It's going to be a step from there down to there. But then I thought about all those 400,000 people that had given me the opportunity to make that step and thought, well, it's, it's, it's going to be a big something for all those folks. And indeed, a lot of others that even weren't even involved in the project. So it was a, a, a kind of a simple correlation of thoughts. The pictures that came back were quite remarkable. What did it look like to you, to your naked eye? It's, uh, it's a brilliant surface in that sunlight. The horizon seems quite close to you because the curvature is so much more pronounced than here on Earth. It's an interesting uh, place to be. Uh, it's, uh, I recommend it. <laughs> and you know this. For years, for years, Neil Armstrong refused to be interviewed. I found that to be one of the strangest things of anything. You would think that the first man on the moon, the national hero that he is, would have talked to everyone about the experience, about the wonder. Yeah, that didn't his happen. His role model was Lindbergh, and Lindbergh became a very public person and was very much out there with his political views and all that. You'd think that that uh, Neil would have at least wanted to be a role model for the next generation. Instead, he became essentially a recluse, a hermit. And on every anniversary, they would wind him up and trot him out in public. The most interesting one was during the Clinton years at the White House on the 25th anniversary. Or do you remember what Armstrong said, the most stunning thing that an astronaut could say, and I think in this milieu get away with it? Give us the quote. Well, he, he said two things. At the start of his speech, he compared himself and the other astronauts to birds, to parrots. And he then made a joke, and he said, and parrots don't fly very well. Well, what else do parrots do, George? <laughs> they repeat what, what they're they told. told. Plant his foot on the surface of the moon has been a pioneer in many ways. And Mr. Armstrong, in asking you to come to the podium, may I say that millions of Americans have admired you not only for your achievement, but for the quiet dignity with which you have conducted yourself and represented not only our country, but humankind. Ladies and gentlemen, Neil Armstrong.
Thank you, Mr. Vice President, Mr. President, members of Congress, fellow astronauts, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Wilbur Wright once noted that the only bird that could talk was the parrot, and he didn't fly very well. <laughs> So I'll, I'll be brief. <laughs> this, this week, uh, America has been recalling the Apollo program and reliving uh, the memories of those times in which so many of us here, the colleagues here in the first rows, were immersed. Our old astrogeology mentor, Gene Schumann even called in one of his comets to mark the occasion with spectacular Jovian fireworks. And reminding us once again of the power and consequence of celestial extracurricular activities. Many Americans were part of Apollo, about one or two in each thousand citizens all across the country. They were asked by their country to do the impossible, to envisage, to design, and to build a method of breaking the bonds of Earth's gravity, and then sally forth and visit another heavenly body. The principal elements, leaving Earth, navigating in space, and descending to a planet unencumbered with runways and traffic controls, would include the major requirements necessary for a spacefaring people. Today, a space shuttle flies overhead with an international crew. A number of countries have international space programs. During the space age, we have increased the knowledge of our universe a thousandfold. Today we have with us uh, a group of students among America's best. To you, we say, we've only completed a beginning. We leave you much that is undone. There are great ideas undiscovered. Breakthroughs available to those who can remove one of truth's protective layers. There are places to go beyond belief. Those challenges are yours. In many fields, not the least of which is space, because there lies human destiny. riveted on the first man on the moon, talking to them, and he looked at them and he said, there are wonders beyond belief. There are truths to be revealed if one can remove truth's protective layers. Now, where in the world does one get the idea the truth has to have protection to be found out? Really? I mean, is that why you think of interviews? Yes, and, 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 and in, in fact, uh, that actually began to affect my own perception of it, watching what ha what happened to him. Okay, in what way? Just seeing the deterioration of him? And, I mean, was he depressed? Or He was depressed. He was uh, drinking heavily, um, bitter, scared, uh, just phobic, avoiding people, uh, and that guy Bart Sibrell or something tried to get him to swear in a Bible. Me. I mean, I mean, what, when I say it affected me, that's why there was so much time in between films for me. Between uh, uh, yeah, Full, you, Metal, Full yeah. Metal Jacket and well, between uh, uh, The Shining and Full Metal Jacket was about six years. 
between Full Metal Jacket and Eyes Wide Shut is 13 years. Yeah. And a lot of that time was spent just... Like just emotionally processing? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it became very conflicting for me. I was proud of my work, but at the same time... And this was a lot, due to, a lot because of Neil's influence. Not consciously. He didn't do this to me consciously. But I spent a lot of time with him, and each time I did, I became more and more bothered, troubled by my own participation in this. Okay. Wow. What would he say? I mean, what, what was, did he explain the source of his depression? I he mean, was what... on the verge of tears. He did not cry. I won't say he cried, but he was on the verge of tears so many times because of what he did. I mean... What he participated in. It's almost as if he thought up the idea, you know? Right. He felt that guilt. He was almost used, really. Okay. But he's the one who felt the guilt. I'm sure NASA did not feel that much guilt. And, I mean, why did he go up, I wonder? I wonder why. Because they promised him a seat and that, in three years when they figured it out. They kept lying about it being possible. So why do you think he did it? Why did Armstrong do it in the first sorry, place? He, he thought, they kept saying, we'll be ready in three years and you'll go then. Just lie now and we'll go in three years. The funding will keep going and we'll, we'll figure this out and you'll go. Oh, actually go. Right, okay, yeah. Okay. And they, but they were lying, you know, yeah. and, that, and they figured it out. And he got really, you know, so cynical. Got it? Okay. So, uh, so why did Armstrong go? I mean, he was such a moral principled man. If he, why would he go on a fake moon mission? I don't believe that. <laughs> well, they strung him along because they led him to believe Oh, don't worry, we're going to have the money in a few years, and we'll actually go, and then you will go. They'll have, uh, of course, you they mean they'll have the technology in a few years? Yes. Okay. They will have enough, they will, yes, they will be able to uh, actually perform the miracle of going to the moon. And yes, he would be in the saddle. So in other words, okay, let's make this clear. Kennedy set it a deadline, psychological deadline of the 60s. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. They knew they couldn't beat it. Right. But so they, they could be they great if they did. Right. And if they did, you're saying they sincerely thought that they would really get there within a few years. I believe, yes, they did think so. Because that's what they, well, I mean, that's... Although what, some didn't. There was a, a difference of opinion. There were some that just believed honestly that we will never be able to get there. There's just no chance. That Werner and I used to like have coffee in the mornings, and he was like, that, you know, there, uh, there's no fucking way. Like, you know, is it right? like, you know even Werner von Braun. Right, 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 right. So go, you got that. Some people didn't believe that you could go even. Well, and... Werner von Braun, of course, didn't think Are, so. The director didn't think so. The man was just too brilliant. He knew that we couldn't do it. Yeah. <laughs> Are you... So, okay, I'm talking about a guy working for, on two lost causes, the Nazism and, 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 and you know, the, the, the quest for the moon. I mean, he really, did, and he didn't tell them? I mean, did he ever tell them, did he tell the NASA, like, did he tell the president we can't go? I mean, I mean, he must have, he must have been broke the news. People, he was very old, of course, at the time, and a lot of people just dismissed him. Younger, more ambitious people, some of them really thought we could get there. Right. Or wanted to believe it. Maybe on a conscious level they knew we couldn't, but they just wanted to believe the impossible because they were so full of themselves. And so full of the dream. Yes. The dream The dream was very powerful. And that's what beguiled Armstrong. Here is a noble stand-up guy, and he didn't want to be part of the lie, but he, he knew he'd get a seat if he played ball on when, when they actually did go up. He was too good but, for this. But that day never came, obviously. That day never came. And what did that do to him? I mean... It gradually destroyed him, I think. I knew we would have a, a limited life, but I must say it, w it was a bit shorter than my expectation. I fully expected that by the end of the century, we would have achieved substantially more than we actually uh, did. And why do you think we didn't? When we lost the competition, we lost the public will to continue. Okay. He deteriorated. Um, yeah, like I said, he, he he drank a lot. He was full of self-recrimination, and so was I. Well, mainly from his influence. I, I almost it's like I I caught it okay. from him. And now I'll tell a story about uh, I talked to him one last time before his death, 
and he made me promise to get this news out. It was too great. It was, you know, this yeah, one last story. I, I've died before, so you can't. Okay. One last conversation that, it, that, that uh, right? The last conversation you had was about three months ago. And he said that, you know, uh, one of, you know, that he, he record, like, he's going to write a letter and, and put it in a drawer and maybe his wife someday will give it out. But he's like, or it's like, you, you know, you're a media guy. You got to tell the truth one day, you know, right before, but he urged me to tell the truth. You know, he, no, he couldn't because of reasons that, that because he was a government employee his whole life and he had a government pension and here I'm a millionaire. Like, you know, you, you can afford to Stanley, tell the truth. You know, I still get a government pension, you know, you know what I'm saying? And, and, and that's been eating on you to do this. And that's why you're not doing it now. You're doing it 15 years from now you know, or whenever. Like, in other words, you're telling this. That's why you're not announcing on CNN. It's because you're going to honor his wish. But you're not ready for it now to come out. But this is, you're doing this why for now. Why am I putting it off? Because I think I'll be Because surprised. you don't want your family. You, you want to be dead. Right, right, right. And you don't want your family to have 15 years on it. Your wife will probably be dead and your kid will be grown. Right. You want distance from your legacy from this truth. That's it. Okay. okay. Right, right. So, what happened? Um, so, so, so what? So, so, what really motivated contacting me as a filmmaker was I talked to Neil, okay, and I was I really felt guilty, and that's why I arranged for you to interview me because I wanted to blah blah blah. blah. Let's talk about the motive. So, so wait, so so Neil really got to you. I mean, it sounds like he's the impetus of this entire confession in a way. I mean. It, it's your it's like a theme like so he really yes, he made you become me. circumspect uh, about this he even virtually begged me to um reveal all this he couldn't do it himself he he has a pension to worry about uh i have basically nothing to lose i'm you know an established filmmaker not involved with the government in any way except for this one job and I, I made my my millions. I'm I'm really basically set for life. I'm almost seventy. But you still must fear one thing they can do to you, which is I mean I don't know. Do you ever? I mean you, they are you obviously do you ever worry about them killing you because of the secret? I mean you have become a bit of a recluse. I don't know. The, you know with the yeah. Um, Garbo, Howard Hughes, J D. Salinger, and me. Right. And to some degree Neil. But did they? I mean, did any of them think that? the government was out to get them. And I'm not saying you think that, do you? I mean, the government obviously no, said they'll kill you. I mean, obviously the government said it will kill you if, if you say anything. I mean, that, that's a standard top secret sort of penalty. It's for, understood, even if it's not said. Right. But they did say it to you, I presume. Yeah. They, they, they did. I mean, the, yes, the government, they, yes, they, 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 they said basically, so it they wasn't. They might be cute about it, but yeah, it was said. In no uncertain terms. So why are you? So this won't this can't this get you killed? Well, that's why I'm uh, delaying it. Okay, the fifteen years thing. This is thing. not going to be seen. Okay, until for another fifteen years 15 after your death. Well, no, that's if you die tomorrow. You're not going to die tomorrow, clearly. I'm sorry. Okay, try again. Try again. Okay, it's okay. This so why do you, you could get killed by doing this? This could kill you. Why are you doing that? That's. Well, this is not going to be seen until oh, because of our fifteen years after my. So death. now I, that's why you have you signed the NDA and all these. Okay. That's right. All right. Well, that makes sense now. Okay, I understand yes. that now. All right. It should be known, but I want there to be some kind of cushion for my family. Uh, fifteen years seems like a good. Number. Okay. All right. After my death, fifteen years after my death. But okay, so let's take a step back. You're making this tape out of. An effect Neil had on you? I mean, Armstrong sort of influenced you? Very much. You? Um, sometimes it just takes a catalyst. I mean, you know, somewhere inside you, you know what's right. Right. I mean, I, I went for years just thinking I was doing the right thing, just just through my art. You know, and then something comes along that uh, you don't even recognize as a temptation because you're so swept away by your own ego. Uh, it took someone like Neil Armstrong and distance and time to hammer into me what this really meant about society, about myself, about the human condition, even which is what I'm about. Uh, so you must feel yes, very proud and very, very, very guilty and proud of this thing. I mean, yes, conflicted. 
I mean, I still think it's a terrible, maybe it's a terrible thing to say, maybe not, but I look at that or even think of it, I just remember it, and I think this was my fucking masterpiece. Yeah. I still think so. Right. I mean, it's the greatest. Despite its flaws, <laughs> it's my goddamn masterpiece. It's better than 2001. It's better than Paths of Glory or or uh, Clockwork Orange or Barry Lyndon or Dr. Strangelove. And, and, All of which I love, but... And, and, and you're included... Right, now, that, that's the moon landing itself, and, that's, and what a triumphal story that is. Uh, were you involved in any of the other missions at all? Or is that just the one? I mean, would they just take your thing? Or did, was it a one-off? Or did you get... Did you do them all? I mean, you just did 11 and 13. They brought you back after 12 failed, okay? Just to, just to do 13. That's it. Um, and Neil helped you with that. So so was it just a one-off? I mean, you just did... Did you do them all? Well, I did 11 and 13 as well. You did 13, um, okay. Not 12. Why, did, why is 13 they, a failure then? Why did you... Well, they brought me back. And why? But why did you make it? Twelve failed. You twelve failed? How? What do you mean? How did twelve fail? Tell me, twelve failed. How did it? I'm I'm asking you a character. How did twelve fail? Tim, can we stop? Nobody that? watched it. No one cared. Oh, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay, so you did eleven and thirteen. But why? Why thirteen? Why did you make thirteen and do like a failure? Why did you? Because 12 was a disaster. I mean, we mean why? cared anymore. They, 72. Uh, oh. By then, it was old hat almost. People just didn't care. And that's why they had to play golf up there. Okay, so... I mean, as if golf was, was the you know, was watchable. Okay. okay. <laughs> I mean, if they'd had a horse race, that would have been watchable. <laughs> that's true. But a, a golf match, I mean, a, a golf game on the moon... Right. Know. Okay, so they weren't getting the ratings. That actually. wasn't my idea. I, okay. I, I will not take credit for that. Okay, so so it was really a ratings issue. That if they twelve didn't pull the the ratings, that eleven did. And so why did you come up with thirteen storyline? Like, what, how'd that happen? Zero six zero. And then if you could uh, give your oxygen tanks a stir. Roger that. Stir the tanks. Whoa. Hey. Uh, this is Houston. Uh, say again, please. Houston, we have a problem. Coming to the moment, the last moments of Apollo 13, as it comes in, as it begins its re-entry. The best thing we can do now is just to listen and hope. The last few seconds down to re-entry. At this point, there's very little anybody can do, including the astronauts, except wait as they come in through the up, uppermost fringes of the Earth's atmosphere. The computers put them on course. All anybody can do now is cross their fingers. Houston, uh, we've just had loss of signal uh, from uh, Honeysuckle. Uh, and they are coming in faster than predicted. They're coming in just about as fast as any spacecraft has returned from space before. The last few seconds now to re-entry, and they've lost them on the main radio contact antenna in Australia at Honeysuckle Creek. <laughs> Just about now, they should be going through the moment of maximum heat. And 
We'll only know whether or not that heat shield was damaged by the explosion three days ago when they come out of radio blackout in just over two minutes. Thirty seconds to go to the end of radio blackout. About loud. thirty seconds to go uh, for blackout. Less than ten seconds now. Uh, we will attempt to uh, contact Apollo 13 uh, through one of the Araya aircraft. Continuing to monitor this Apollo Control Houston. Uh, Jim Lovell responding with the OK Joe. Correction there, that was Command Module Pilot Jack Swagger. We're looking at the weather on TV and it looks just as advertised, real good. Less than two minutes now from time of drove deployment. That drogue deployment that he's talking about is the point at which the very small parachutes come out that then drag up the main parachutes. They have been seen before those drogue parachutes come out on previous missions, but today all we can be certain of is that everybody's watching for those small red and white parachutes to come out to signal the final safety stage of this flight. There they are. There they are. They've made it. All three shoots out. Honestly, Listen to the crowd on the boat. The mains, it really looks great. An extremely loud applause here in Mission Control. Extremely loud applause as Apollo 13 on uh, main shoots comes through loud and clear on the television display here. Venting. Yes, venting the last of the fuel there. You saw that smoke go up? Uh, we have a report uh, from the Iwo Jima that Apollo 13 uh, at a distance of four miles from the ship. Oh, my. Uh, the smoke you see is uh, venting of RCS uh, propellants, uh, reaction control system propellants. <laughs> and they're in, they're in, and I make it no more. No more than five seconds late. No more than five seconds late. I was going to say, like, why not CNN or, but what, who cares? White Truth Right is about a future movie or something coming out or? No. Okay. It's not about any movie. It's not about the movies I've made in the past. It's a confession of sorts. Okay. I mean, about you cheated on your wife, you no. plagiarized. I would never do that. No. Plagiarized something. It's about a movie I made that nobody is aware of, even though they've seen it. Okay. Is that intriguing? Do I have you intrigued? Well, I mean, see if I understand what you say. It's about 
A movie you may, no one knows you made. Is that what you said? That's right. It's a production. Like, I, I, some I of you put, I, like, I, you didn't put your name on it? Like, at the end, you put, like, a fake name? Oh, no. I I made it. Like, Alan Smithy, like that That's right. Thing? No, I didn't. There was no name put on it. Why? Why would there be no credits? What do you mean? Because there are some things that you just can't put your name on. Okay. Okay. Wait, wait, wait. I perpetrated a huge fraud, which I am now about to detail. Okay. Involving the United States government and NASA. All right. What? And I'm sure you've heard the rumors. The moon, the moon landing. Hoax? That's right. That the moon landing was fake. The, the moon landing, moon landings, all were fake. <laughs> And I was the person who filmed it. You're serious. And, okay. I'm serious. You're, I'm dead serious. Because I only have this certain amount of time with you, and, I, and I'll talk about whatever you want. You know, this isn't some type of joke or no, it's not film a joke. within a film thing. It's not a joke. Nope. Okay. The uh, conspiracy theorists were right on this, on this occasion. Why? I don't know about Paul McCartney's death, but... This, they were right about. Okay, why in God's name would... I don't know what to ask you first. Why the hell, if you're telling the truth, why would you do it? Why are you telling me? I mean, what the... Don't you think it's important for people to know the truth? Yeah, I got... Uh, yes, certainly. They had a, a, a massive fraud, a, an unparalleled fraud perpetrated against them. They should know. Okay. Um, I, I mean, they're already suspicious of the government. They may as well have their suspicions confirmed. Okay. Okay.